Welcome back everybody to another episode of Direct Comparison. In today's episode, we're taking a much more in-depth look at the recently released Final Fantasy VII Remake, and seeing how it stacks up to the original game from 1997. Now of course, this is a remake of a game that was made over 20 years ago, so we should expect to see improvements visually in just about every field. So, while I'll still cover the basics of the game's presentation, a major focus for this particular video will be on the story, the gameplay, and the overall scale of the experience, along with a few sound samples as always towards the end. Bear in mind that the Final Fantasy remake that's available now is not the full Final Fantasy VII experience. It instead only covers the portion of the story within Midgard, which by itself is only a fraction of the original Final Fantasy VII. Because of this, I'm going to be restricting this comparison to only the Midgar area, and will be disregarding any environments or characters introduced after that part of the original game. Alright, so to kick this comparison off, let's begin by taking a brief look at the presentation, starting with our character models. Now of course, as I already mentioned back at the beginning of March when looking at the demo, all of the characters have been completely reimagined using Square's far more advanced technology. Characters that were composed of only a few polygons before are now more complex, with high resolution textures, tons of tiny details, and more advanced animations. With the demo, we were only given a small glimpse at some of the characters, including the lead protagonist Cloud Strife, who looks a lot less like Popeye the Sailor and more like a normal person. His outfit also appears much darker, more in line with his appearance in the original cinematics. Barret, the massive loudmouth with a gun for an arm, is expanded even further, with new straps and cloth along his arm to help show how the gun is staying attached, and a few other small details like a pair of dog tags hanging around his neck, and new sunglasses to help give him a bit more personality. Tifa looks practically identical. She's still sporting her mini skirt and small tank top, but her red eyes are now emphasized a bit more, and her hair is slightly shorter. We could spend hours going over all of the characters and how they've been improved, but I think you get the point. They retain all the characteristics you remember while expanding upon them. It's a really confident reimagining of these unique designs, and one that does so without ever abandoning their core personality. And this of course extends to all the enemies you'll face too. From Shinra's police force to the giant sewer monster, everything has been restored here. Even some of the enemies that were so absurd before that I wasn't sure they'd be included. And while some enemies, like the House, aren't regular combatants anymore, and reserved for special encounters during missions, they're still given a respectful presence in the action, and just like our hero characters, retain all the iconic features that fans will remember. There's even a few new enemy types that I'll talk about in more detail with my final review. Next, let's briefly go over the environmental design. Now, with the original game, the environments were built using beautiful, pre-rendered background images with a few lights and fire sprites added on top to help provide more depth. The character models walk over top of these pre-rendered scenes, moving in and out of the screen to simulate traveling under and over objects in the background. It's silly looking by today's standards, but it really was incredible exploring all these unique locations, each with their own distinct feel and personality, assisted further by the absolutely incredible soundtrack. No longer held back by the same hardware limitations, the remake reimagines all of the original game's Midgar locations, with every iconic street corner and structure being greatly expanded upon with significantly more detail. The collapsed expressway, for example, a tunnel filled with a bunch of wrecked cars and giant robot hands, is now much longer, with even more debris and robot arms scattered throughout that can even be controlled directly. One of the most interesting changes, though, is Wall Market. In the original, Wall Market looks like a bunch of makeshift structures built out of tents and debris, all on top of what looks like a fairground. This area is filled with several different shops to visit, like bars, restaurants, and a gym, all with NPCs to talk to and things to interact with. And while all these shops are retained in the remake, Wall Market doesn't look quite the same. It looks like one of the larger settlements in a Fallout game, with lots of tall buildings, neon signs, and more storefronts scattered throughout. It's certainly more impressive looking, especially when you first arrive, though it's still a big departure from its original design. Still, everything is very clearly inspired from the original. The Don's mansion interior looks identical to the original pre-rendered background, as do locations like the Sector 5 church, the Mako reactors, and various aspects of the Shinra building. But a few alterations have been made throughout to benefit the flow of the story and gameplay, which I'll expand upon more in a bit. As far as everything else visually, it's pretty self-explanatory. 
the original game's lighting, for example, is basically non-existent, with different shades being used in the overworld screen to create shadow and depth, while some very basic ambient light is used for the battles. The remake, however, incorporates a whole bunch of advanced lighting methods, including volumetric lighting and screen space reflections to help give the floors of the Shinra building a more polished look. They're not necessarily the best lighting effects out there, and often cause characters like Cloud to look a bit washed out in the image, but it's still impressive all things considered, and helps to give the dialogue sequences a far more cinematic feel. And then of course we have our effects, that look absolutely incredible in the remake, with particles flying everywhere as Cloud's sword clashes with metal robotic enemies. The original game, of course, has things like fire and electricity, but not to this degree, and not with this many enemies on screen at once. But all this is to be expected. The original game predates the remake by over two decades. So let's turn our attention away from the visuals and towards the overall structure, starting with the story. Now, for those of you who have never played Final Fantasy VII or just want all the story changes to be a surprise, bear in mind that this section will have some spoilers. But I'll try to be vague for some of the more major story-related changes. So starting off, we have the Mako Reactor bombing mission, which feels just about the same. Avalanche disembarks a train, fights their way to the reactor, and sets a bomb. All the characters, including Cloud, Wedge, Biggs, Jess, and Barrett, are present, and even hang out in their same spots as they did before. But Cloud's sudden mental breakdowns as he's planting the bomb are more vivid this time, and far more frequent. Throughout the game, Cloud will see several mysterious visions, whereas before, the game only had a few brief dialogue bubbles pop up throughout. Now, I won't show the actual visions themselves, but you've probably already seen them with trailers for this remake, and it does seem like a very strange move to incorporate that specific character so early on in this remake series. It's sort of explained towards the end, but that's a topic I'll save for my final review later on. The next major change is that the bomb that Cloud plants doesn't blow up the reactor. It barely even leaves a dent. Instead, a new cutscene shows that Shinra was watching the attack all along, and purposely destroys the Maka reactor themselves after the bomb fails to do its job. By doing this, the game is a bit more black and white than before. Avalanche previously was in a gray area, where they were committing eco-terrorism to save the planet, but were also jeopardizing innocent lives. This concept is still very much explored throughout the remake, as the characters still think that they were responsible. But from the audience's perspective, there's less reason to question the motives of characters like Tifa or Barrett. But the bigger change comes after the Maka reactor mission. In the original game, players meet up with Aerith in the city streets as they're fleeing the scene of the crime. This happens the same way in the remake, though instead of Aerith just walking away peacefully, she's now attacked by a mysterious invisible enemy, a swarm of ghostly entities called Whispers, that look like they're straight out of Harry Potter. Now, again, I don't want to give away too much, but these new characters serve a major role in the remake story, yet were never actually featured in the original game, making them one of the biggest changes that have been made. After an extended Sector 8 escape sequence, the remake continues on the same track, with players boarding a train with the Avalanche members and heading back to their headquarters in the slums. But instead of following them down into their secret lair using the pinball machine, Cloud is instead forced to wait upstairs. A nice change, considering it never really made sense why they'd invite him downstairs to their base of operations anyway. From here, the game deviates heavily from its source material. Players are asked to build up a reputation in the slums for a few hours, doing a few interesting quests and getting to know the town's people more. This is a really nice change, as it not only lets players connect more with various members of Avalanche, but also helps to make the events that unfold later more impactful. And even if you think you know what I'm talking about because you played the original, you'll still end up being surprised, as some characters may have a different fate than you remember. The remake even adds entirely new missions to the game, including one where Cloud tags along with Biggs, Wedge, and Jess for a secret mission to gather bomb components, again expanding upon the relationships a lot more. The game gets back on track when Cloud heads out with Barrett and Tifa to target another reactor, and even has an identical split boss fight with the Airbuster machine on the catwalks. Though, the interaction between the team and the president of Shinra is handled a lot differently. The president no longer appears in person, but instead via a massive hologram projection. Additionally, he reveals that Cloud and his friends are being broadcasted live to the people of Midgar, in his attempt to put all the blame on the eco-terrorists. It's an interesting extension to the story that makes him a much more cunning foe. But again, the general premise is still the same, and the end results are identical. 
The game continues this trend all throughout, with Cloud and Aerith meeting again, then following Tifa to Wall Market and Cloud cross-dressing to gain access to the Dawn. But there's a few minor changes, like Cloud and Aerith end up helping a lot more in the Sector 5 slums. And Cloud is given a dress not by the old man at the clothing shop, but by the owner of the Honey Bee Inn during a dance performance. And then the biggest deviation happens at the very end, where the game takes a complete 180 and becomes something different entirely. Again, I'll expand upon this with my final review more, but just know that it won't end how you think. Now, let's talk about the gameplay design. Final Fantasy VII from 1997 is a churn-based RPG, where players walk around a map screen talking to NPCs, grabbing items, and being thrust randomly into churn-based battles. The battles force players to choose from a list of commands, split up into distinct categories including physical attacks, magic, summons, and items. These commands can only be activated when a cooldown timer has reset in the bottom right corner of the screen, but these commands work independently for each character in the battle, including the enemy. Additionally, magic attacks require specific magic points to trigger, which can be replenished by consuming items like Aether. Now, the goal of each battle is obviously to drain the enemy's HP down to zero, and doing so requires proficient knowledge of that enemy's weaknesses, strengths, and other important attributes. Knowing this, you can plan your attacks accordingly, avoiding certain types of attacks and balancing healing and magic with the occasional powerful limit attack that's built up after receiving damage. Players can manually configure each of their characters using three types of equipables, weapons, armor, and accessories. And then of course there's materia that can be slotted into weapons and armor, and allows the player to perform special abilities like launching fireballs or lightning. The remake takes every aspect of the original game's combat design and tweaks it so that it's more involved. While it may look like an oversimplified hack and slash reboot, the remake doesn't play anything like Devil May Cry or God of War. Smashing the square button won't get you very far against more challenging enemies. What it does do though, is help to fill a new bar called the ATP gauge. By filling up this gauge, players can use their command menu or new hotkeys to use things like potions, magic, and more powerful attacks. The idea here is to replace the old game's long wait times with some dodging and slashing, something that works surprisingly well while still retaining the classic turn-based attack style, thanks to the way the command menu pauses the game slightly while you set up a coordinated attack with your party. Enemies also feature a new stagger bar, which is filled rapidly depending on the type of attack used and the frequency of the attacks performed. If an enemy is vulnerable to a certain type of attack, a notification that says pressure will appear encouraging more aggressive attacks from the player. If done properly, the enemy's stagger bar will be filled and cause them to be stunned temporarily, with each hit adding to a percentage of the amount of damage being dealt. This system is key to the combat in the Final Fantasy VII Remake, as taking advantage of it can mean the difference between a long drawn out battle with lots of wasted Phoenix Down revives, or a decently long fight with only a few bumps and bruises. Because of this reworked combat system, a few of the old moves have been reworked slightly and put into different categories. Cloud's Braver Limit Break, for example, is now one of the attacks that requires a single ATP segment to trigger, and Tifa's weird slot machine mechanic used to chain her attacks has also been removed in favor of a more fluid combat system designed to take advantage of the new stagger mechanics. Barret and Aerith are designed a lot more around ranged attacks. For these characters, you'll often find yourself looking for room to set up powerful attacks or target weak points, while also supporting the rest of the team with cure materia and other items. Unfortunately, Red 13, the laboratory experiment that you meet in the Shinra building, is not playable, and instead functions as a guest fighter, controlled entirely by the AI. He only shows up at the very end, so it isn't too big a deal, but hopefully we'll see him playable in the next game. Overall, the combat is a huge improvement over the original design, as it takes everything that worked and expands upon it with a more involved style. That being said, fans of the original who aren't as skilled with timed dodges and effectively managing characters in battle may find this new version way more challenging, with some battles lasting upwards of 30 minutes with no checkpoints in between. And this is only for the Midgar sections, just imagine what the next few remakes will be like. To make up for this huge increase in difficulty, the remake now offers benches that players can sit down at to rest and instantly recover both health and magic for their entire party, along with a vending machine that can be used to purchase items like potions using collected gill. Players can also find these items more frequently in the game world, especially inside piles of Shinra crates that can be smashed open, or from completing optional side quests at certain points in the story. 
While still not necessarily an open world game, the remake does offer a few elements synonymous with that genre of game. The slums of Midgar offer a few interesting new additions, like mini games to play, music to collect, small quests to discover, and lots of secrets hidden throughout. You can even travel between areas using Chocobo fast travels, which are accompanied by a loading screen playing that iconic Chocobo theme. Finally, let's listen to a few sound comparisons. Which game do you think has the better overall audio design? Get down here, Merc. And that wraps up this episode of Direct Comparison. Overall, the Final Fantasy VII Remake is a beautiful reimagining of an iconic classic. Square Enix had a lot riding on this, as it's one of the most cherished titles from the original PlayStation era. And while it's certainly disappointing that the remake is only a fraction of the original experience, it still works extremely well. The entirety of Midgar in the old game only took me about 6 hours to play through, whereas the remake took me nearly 40 hours. And that's not 40 hours of boring side quests. Every time I hit the record button, it was another 15 to 20 minutes of straight action, with sections like the sewers or the Mako reactors taking way longer than the source material. This is the perfect example of how to remake a classic, 
Well, it's certainly nice to have an original game cleaned up with nicer graphics, but all the original level structures and mechanics left intact. It's even more impressive when a developer goes above and beyond and finds a way to bring that classic experience into the next generation of gaming. But what do you guys think? Are you impressed with the Final Fantasy VII Remake, or were you expecting more? Let me know in the comments section. If you want to catch my full review later on, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos posted every week.